Now let's discuss the concepts of efficacy and potency. Suppose we have two drugs. Let's call the first one Pionix and the second one pee freely. Now suppose these drugs are used to help patients pee. So let me draw a bladder here. Uh, this is my version of a bladder. And let's say that contraction of the bladder in this case is governed by a single receptor which Pionix and pee freely both bind to. Now of course the actual situation is a little bit more complicated than this, but this is a good model to explain the concepts. Efficacy is measured as the maximal effect a drug can produce when it is bound to all the receptors available. So when we give Pionix in a saturating dose so that all the receptors of the bladder are bound, let's say that our patient is able to pee 200 milliliters of urine. On the other hand, when we give pee freely at a saturating dose, say that our patient is only able to pee 150 milliliters. Pionix would be the more efficacious drug because when all the receptors that result in the contraction of the bladder are bound by Pionix, our patient is able to produce 200 milliliters of urine. Notice that we've said nothing about the dose of Pionix or P freely that we are giving. That's because efficacy is concerned with the maximal effect that can be achieved at saturating doses. It doesn't actually matter what the dose is. Potency, on the other hand, is concerned with the amount of drug given. Suppose we want our patient to pee 100 milliliters. Say that to achieve 100 milliliters of urine, we need to give 20 milligrams of Pionix. But we find out that it only takes 5 milligrams of pee freely to get our patient to pee 100 milliliters. Thus, we would say that pee freely is the more potent drug. And that's because it only took 5 milligrams of pee freely to achieve 100 milliliters of urine. And this can very much be the case in the real world. Just because a drug is more efficacious doesn't mean that it's more potent. In this slide on pharmacodynamics, that is the effect of drugs on the body, we'll talk about how different inhibitors or antagonists can alter the potency or efficacy of certain drugs. These are three figures here that you should be very familiar with by test day. Figure A shows the effect of a competitive antagonist. Again, let's use our bladder example. And let's say that the drug that we're using is Pionix. So here, where it says agonist dose, we're actually talking about the dose of Pionix. So on the x-axis, we have increasing dose. And on the y-axis, we have the percent of maximum effect. Remember that the effect that we're interested in here is the amount of urine that can be produced with the drug. And remember for the case of Pionix, we found that the maximum effect was 200 milliliters. Notice the curve that we have for Pionix. Here we see that it takes about one unit of Pionix to achieve 50% of our maximum effect. The x-axis, of course, is being given in a relative scale, but we could have just as easily have used an x-axis which was given in milligrams. Keeping consistent with our previous slide, however, we remember that it took 20 milligrams of Pionix for the patient to pee 100 milliliters, or 50% of the maximum effect. However, for illustrative purposes, we'll stay with this relative scale. Also note that this scale is logarithmic. In any case, notice that in the presence of a competitive antagonist, we have a large shift to the right. In the presence of this antagonist, notice that we now have to give 10 times as much drug to get our patient to pee 100 milliliters. Competitive antagonists often bind to the same site on a receptor that our drug of interest binds to. Competitive antagonists are also often reversible inhibitors. This means that they do not permanently bind the receptor. Their overall effect, however, is to decrease the number of available receptors for our drug. In other words, they occupy sites that our drug could be binding to. Because of this, we see that we have to give much more drug to achieve the same effect. In other words, they decrease the potency of our drug. Notice, however, that at very high concentrations of our drug, we are still able to get our patient to pee 200 milliliters. 
And this is because, much like the so-called competitive inhibitors that we discussed very early on in this lecture, we can give enough drug to outcompete the competitive antagonist. Compare this with what happens when we give a patient a non-competitive antagonist, which is depicted in graph B. Non-competitive antagonists can either bind to the same or different site which our drug of interest binds to. However, they are very often irreversible inhibitors. What this means is that once they bind to a receptor, they permanently change that receptor so that it can no longer bind to our drug of interest. Said differently, non-competitive antagonists permanently decrease the number of available receptors. Notice that even with very high doses of pionics, we can no longer get our patient to pee 200 milliliters. The most we can get is 100 milliliters. And this is because the number of receptors which are available to pionics has decreased significantly. Thus, the bladder cannot be made to contract as much as it used to. In other words, non-competitive or irreversible inhibitors decrease the efficacy of our drug. Our last example is the partial agonist, which is depicted in graph C. A partial agonist of pionics would bind to the same site as pionics and induce contraction of the bladder, but it does so with less efficacy. That is, our partial agonist is a weaker drug. It does the same thing as our drug of interest, but simply doesn't do it quote-unquote as well. Thus, in the presence of a partial agonist, we have an apparent decrease in the efficacy. And that's because of all the receptors that cause contraction of the bladder, some are going to be bound by our partial agonist, which results in an overall decline in the effect that we can achieve. Finally, know that partial agonists can actually increase, decrease, or leave the potency unchanged. A good example of a common partial agonist is buprenorphine. Buprenorphine has the same effect on the opioid mu receptor as does morphine, but is less efficacious than morphine itself. As you can see here, a common example of a non-competitive antagonist is phenoxybenzamine, and of a competitive antagonist, Flumazenil. Let's now talk about something which is known as physiologic antagonism. Physiologic antagonists are antagonists which produce a physiologic effect which is opposite of our drug of interest. However, they do so not by acting on the same receptor as our drug of interest, but by acting on an entirely different receptor. A good example of this is epinephrine. Epinephrine is the physiologic antagonist of acetylcholine in the lung. Remember that acetylcholine can cause bronchoconstriction, and it does this by binding to acetylcholine receptors, which are found on the smooth muscle cells surrounding the bronchioles. Epinephrine can oppose this effect because it induces the dilation of bronchioles. That is, it induces the relaxation of the same smooth muscle cells but it does so not by interacting with acetylcholine receptors, but by beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Hence, epinephrine is a physiologic antagonist of acetylcholine. Finally, let's talk about the therapeutic index of drugs. The therapeutic index is a measure of how safe a drug is, and it is calculated with the equation here, median lethal dose divided by median effective dose. The median lethal dose is the dose required to kill 50% of our experimental subjects. So say that we have a group of mice, and we find that when we give 2,000 milligrams of pionics, half of our mice die. Now say when we test the same group of mice, we find that it only takes 20 milligrams of pionics to get them to pee as much as we want them to. And I'm drawing the smiley face as a indicator of success. Thus, our therapeutic index would be equal to 100. Notice that the therapeutic index is simply a number with no units. A therapeutic index of 100 is a relatively safe drug. Compare this with relatively unsafe drugs like digoxin, which has an index of about 2 or 3. Of course, the higher our therapeutic index, the more sure we can be that the drug will not result in adverse effects even when taken in higher than recommended doses. In contrast, 
drugs with a low therapeutic index must be carefully monitored because the quote-unquote therapeutic window is relatively narrow.